Okay, so in this video we're going to look at um, a variety of um, exam style questions to do with time of flight mass spectrometry or, or to do with mass spectrometry mostly which will then go on to time of flight. Um, they start off fairly straightforward and, and are really there just to highlight a couple of things um, and then they get progressively more difficult and then by the end there are some real conceptual well, mathematical leaps I guess um, that we're having to make but um, and I will probably go a little bit over the top in terms of explaining them and setting them out um, you can take shorter cuts or make assumptions once you understand it but I think for you to be able to make those shorter cuts more confidently I think you need to understand the principles behind um, what we're doing so um, we're going to start off fairly gently so here we're given a um, mass spec graph um, so uh, it's not written on here but I'm just going to do it to remind you um, that the x-axis uh, represents mz values so mass over charge values um, we've got the relative abundance now notice our scale here is um, goes up to five and we've only got four peaks so the first thing to recognize uh, and the main reason for choosing this question is that the total abundance is not going to be it's not going to add up to 100. We are not talking about a relative ab abundance in terms of, of percentages here. So we're still doing exactly the same calculation that we would normally do, but we've just got to avoid that autopilot of putting 100 as your denominator in your calculation. Okay, so uh, let's consider our calculation. We've got three, four, sorry, four different isotopes. Uh, we've got an isotope with a mass of 70, one with a mass of 72, one with a mass of 73, one with a mass of 74. And we have um, different abundances. So we have three, four, one, and five. So we'll start our calculation now. Um, so we have an isotope with a value of 70 and its abundance is three. So we multiply those together. And we're going to add, uh, we've got an isotope of 72, and we've got an abundance of 4, an isotope of 73, abundance of 1, and an isotope of 74, abundance of 5. And then that is all over the total abundance. So let's just write it out. 3 plus 4 plus 1 plus 5. So we do that calculation uh, in our using our calculator, and we get an answer of so that equals seventy two point three eight, and we can have a very sort of rough check that we're vaguely potentially right um, in that our well in that our calculation is an average a calculation of an average so our average must be within the range our range is from seventy to seventy four we've got an answer that is between those numbers. So that, uh, that makes sort of sense. Now, something that a lot of people often miss when they're answering these questions is to forget about one of the key points in the question. And these aren't always there, but it did say, give your answer to one decimal place. So we need to do that. And so our answer to one decimal place is 72.4. Okay, so we have a different type of question here. Um, when we did the video or the lesson on time of flight mass spectrometry and mass spectrometry, um, all the calculations that featured in there that we actually did were focused on working out the relative atomic mass of an element. Now, curiously, in this question, we're actually given the relative atomic mass of this element, xenon. This time, uh, the, the information that's lacking or missing is um, uh, the mass and the abundance of one of the isotopes so we've initially got uh, two unknowns. Um, we've got uh, the percentage abundance for the isotope with the mass number we're not sure of. And then we've got the actual mass number of the isotope. Now, uh, we're told uh, that, we're, that the abundance is a percentage, so it must add up to 100%. So we know, uh, that tells us, therefore, that uh, 28 plus... 25 plus 27 plus the to be calculated must equal 100%. So from that, we can work out that the to be, to be calculated value, the percentage abundance of xenon M, must equal 20%. 
So now we just have the one unknown. So we're going to set out the calculation as we normally would, as if we were um, working out the relative atomic mass. Um, but I'm going to let um, y equal um, the um, unknown isotope. Okay. And then I'm just going to do the conventional calculation. So we have um, an isotope with a value of 129, and we have an abundance of 28%. And then we have an isotope of 131 with an abundance of 25%. And we have an isotope of 132 uh, with an abundance of 27. And then we have Y. We don't know what the isotope value is, uh, but we know its abundance is 20%. Um, the total abundance is 100%. And we know that this equals um, our relative atomic mass of 131.31. Okay, so now we go about, um, well, the first thing I would do is I would uh, multiply both sides by 100. And then I'm also going to multiply out those brackets. So um, I'm just going to write the answer to that just now. So you can have a go yourself first, pause the video, and then see if you've got the same answer as me. Um, so it looks something like this. So the 3612 is the 129 times 28. The 3275 is the 131 times 25. The 3564 is the 132 times 27. And then we've got y times 20, so 20y. And then on the right-hand side, because I times both sides by 100 to remove the denominator on the left, and we've got 13,131 on the right. So uh, the next thing to do is to subtract 3612, 3275, and 3564 from both sides. And that gives us 20y equals uh, 2680. And then we divide both sides by 20 and we get 134. So the mass number of the unknown xenon isotope was 134. Now this is where uh, things start to become tricky. So we are given uh, a relative atomic mass of magnesium, 24.3, that's what it is on the periodic table. Um, we're told that there are three isotopes. However, we're only given the abundance of one of those isotopes. So we actually have two unknowns here. We don't know the abundance of magnesium-24 and we don't know the ma abundance of magnesium-26. The crucial thing here is that even though we have two unknowns, we've got to create a mathematical expression which has only one unknown. Otherwise, it's going to be too tricky. Um, so how do we go about doing that? So we know that the abundance of magnesium-25 is 10%. Uh, so that means 90% of all magnesium uh, is magnesium-24 and magnesium-26, okay, because 10% is magnesium-25. So I'm going to let, uh, it doesn't matter which one I choose, but I'm going to let magnesium-24 equal y. That means that magnesium-26, the abundance, must be 90% minus y. So now I have two terms for, um, or I have a term for each of the unknown um, isotopes, magnesium-24 and magnesium-26, but I have only one unknown, I have, only, I have only one algebraic term in there. So now I would write my calculation as I would normally write it. So I have uh, an isotope of 24, and I know that the abundance is y. I have an isotope of 25, and I know that the abundance is 10%. And I have an isotope of 26, and I know that the abundance is 90 minus y. Uh, the total abundance is 100%. And I know that the um, average of all of that is 24.3. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 100. I'm going to um, 
calculate the terms in the brackets. Why don't you have a go at doing that? Um, pause the video and then see, I'm gonna write my answer up for, for doing that and then see if you've got the same as me. So this is what I get. Um, I'm going to now um, minus subtract, sorry, 250 and 2340 from both sides. So I get minus 2y equals minus 160. Um, actually, in the benefit of hindsight, I should have made mg26y and mg24 90 minus y. Um, it would have meant that I didn't end up with these negative numbers, not that it really matters. So y equals 80. So um, y was the percentage abundance of magnesium 24. So um, the percentage abundances for magnesium 24 it was y and that equals 80 percent we know that uh, mg25 was 10 percent and we know that 90 minus y is mg26 90 minus 80 is 10 uh, so 10 percent and if we can just double check all of that that all adds up to 100 percent so those that's how we would go about working out the um relative abundances of two unknown isotopes. But the key thing, and the key thing, and I really can't stress it enough, is that you don't want to start having more than one algebraic term. It makes life difficult. So I've got y and I've got 90 minus y for my two abundances. Okay, so now we're moving on to a time of flight question. Um, I think in every single paper, there has been a time of flight question. So it's fine to find them difficult, and it's fine to get them wrong, but you have to learn eventually how to do them because they will be in the exam. So, and there are different types of questions they can ask, so we're going to look at two types of questions. Um, so this one is, uh, let's just read it. So we've got a barium ion um, with a mass number of 137 traveling through our flight tube of a time of flight spectrometer. They give us the kinetic energy. They tell us how long it takes for the ion to reach the detector. They give us the uh, equation for kinetic energy. They remind us that mass is in kilograms, very kind of them. Um, and we've got velocity or speed. We've got Avogadro's constant, so the fact they've given us that means that we're going to have to use it. They never give you anything. Uh, if they give you a number, you're going to have to use it. Um, we're asked to calculate the length of the flight tube in metres, and we have to give our answer to the appropriate number of significant figures. So, we've been given time, but time doesn't feature in the equation, the kinetic energy equation. We've been asked to calculate distance, but that doesn't feature either in the um, kinetic energy equation. So we have to remember that we're going to almost certainly be using uh, V equals D over T or velocity equals distance over time. So that's going to be a feature. Now my philosophy uh, for questions like these is to try, is to, is, is to leave the numbers to the last possible moment. So get the expression uh, get the calculation all ready to go. So that means doing all the substituting of terms, uh, rearranging of equations, get all of that done first. And then once you've got um, the expression ready, then think about the numbers you're going to put in to it. So we're trying to work out distance. So we want an expression where distance is the subject of our, of our equation. So uh, let's start with our kinetic energy equation. So we know that kinetic energy equals half mv squared. And we know that v equals d over t. So and we know that we're going to need to have distance in our equation. So we're going to substitute v equals d over t into our equation here. So we've got a half times mass times, and it's going to be distance over time squared which is the same as saying half m d squared over t squared, okay? 
Okay, so I've just um, written on the next line, but I've just swapped sides just to make it a little bit easier to see the next bit. So I want to just have D uh, as the subject of the equation. So I'm going to multiply both sides by T squared. I'm going to divide both sides by M and I'm going to multiply both sides by two. So that will mean that I end up with D squared equals two times the kinetic energy times T squared divided by M. And I, I just want D on its own, so I square root everything. So I end up with T, D, sorry, is the square root of two Ke t squared over m, which is the same as saying k. Okay. So if you're not sure about that, um, basically what I've done um, on that last line is uh, I've square rooted t squared, so it's t, but I've got to take it outside of the square root sign to, to be able to do that. So there's my expression. I have the kinetic energy, I have the time, but I don't actually currently have the mass. So before I put any numbers in, I've just got to work out the mass. Now we're talking about a barium-137 iron. Uh, so that means if I had one mole of barium-137, and we are talking about the iron, and because the electron has a negligible mass, it doesn't affect it, that would be a mass of 137 grams because we know that the um, mass or the mass number or MR or AR in grams is the one mole of that substance. Of course, this is um, the kinetic energy equation. We've got to remember that our masses have to be in kilograms. So that, that equals 0.137 kilograms. Now there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 um, ions of barium-137 in one mole of barium-137. So I want to know what the mass of one ion is, so I have to divide my molar mass here by the number of ions in a mole. So the mass of one 137 barium ion is that mass in kilograms of a mole divided by Avogadro's constant. So that's why we were given it, and that's and this is the point at which we're using it. So that equals 2.275 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. I'm gonna keep that number in my calculator though. Okay, so I need to work out distance. I know what time is. I know what the kinetic energy is, I know what the mass is. So now I'm ready to put the numbers in to my final expression to work out what distance is. So distance equals the time, which is 2.71 times 10 to the minus five seconds. And then that is multiplying the square root of two times the kinetic energy and the kinetic energy is 3.65 times 10 to the minus 16 joules. Okay, and then we divide that by the mass of the ion, which we've worked out to be 2.275 times 10 to the minus 25. So we put all of that into our calculator, which I'm just gonna do. I'm gonna pause the video so it's gonna look like I've done it instantly. Put that into our calculator and we get the answer 1.535 meters. Now, if you just look back at the question, um, the very final thing it asks is that we gave it to the appropriate number of, well, gave our answer to the appropriate number of significant figures. Uh, if we think about, well, the way you decide on your significant figures are is like, you can't have an answer that's more precise than the information you were given. So you have to look at the significant figures of the information that you were given and the fewest significant figures in that information will determine 
the number of significant figures for the answer. So our time they gave us to three significant figures. The kinetic energy they gave us to three significant figures. The the mass we could confidently work out to three significant figures. Sure, Avogadro's constants to four, but it doesn't matter because we go with the smallest. So we should be giving three significant figures in our answer. So the distance is 1.54 meters. And I, I appreciate this is easy for me to say, but in these chemistry questions, the answers are always genuine. Um, you know, you'll find that when they give you a, a, a constant or a velocity or a, or a kinetic energy or something, it will be it will be a legitimate number. So to have um, a flight tube of 1.54 meters, if we think that the mass spectrometer is going to fit in a room, albeit it still might be pretty big, the whole thing, 1.54 meters feels sensible. So getting a very, very small distance or a very, very large distance in particular should really sound the alarm bells. So 1.54 meters feels like an answer that's likely to be correct. Okay, we're on the, the last question now. And this is an example of the type of time of flight questions that I think students often find the hardest. Um, and when you look at the March scheme, um, you would see how they suggested you go about answering the question. And I think from, for a lot of people who have found it difficult, that doesn't really make sense. The mark scheme doesn't make sense because, in a sense, it's made a leap of understanding. And I think you need to appreciate how that leap uh, was made. So <laughs> my working here, my working out is going to be... Um, well, I hope it's not convoluted, uh, but it's going to look probably quite intense. I'm going to try and explain... Um, because um, that's because I'm trying to show everything. Uh, you wouldn't need to have to show everything in an exam question. You would just need to understand what to do, what you needed to do. So let's just look at the question. So we're talking about substance Q that has several isotopes. Um, we know that if it's a time of flight mass spectrometer, that um, when they are, um, they're all going to be accelerated so that they all have the same kinetic energy. Uh, they give us that kinetic energy um, equation, um, half mv squared. They remind us that the mass is in kilograms. Um, they do give us v equals d over t, so notice they didn't do that in the previous question, but they have given us velocity as distance over time. They remind us that length is in meters, um, um, and, and so on, and they've given us the time of flight uh, for the q82 ion, and we have to calculate the time of flight for the Q86 ion. So I'm, I'm really going to take this from first principles. Um, as I go through it, I will try to point out where the mark scheme would have entered the thinking, as it were. All right, so we know that the kinetic energies are the same. So we know that the kinetic energy for... Um, the Q82 ion is half mv squared. But of course, we're talking about the mass of the 82 ion, and we're talking about the velocity of the 82 ion. And we know that that has to equal the kinetic energy uh, that uh, the Q86 ion had, which was made up of the mass of the 86 ion times the velocity of the 86 ion squared. And um, we we're going to substitute in V equals D over T, all right? So that means uh, we've got half the mass of the 82 iron is equals D squared. So hopefully this next bit is making sense from the previous example question over the time it took for the 82 iron squared, all right? Now, uh, the D, it's the same flight tube for both of them, so D is the same for both of them, so that's that's really important. And if we carry on, so that equals half the mass of the 86 iron times, and then it's D squared again, and the time of the 86 ion squared. Uh, so we can now cancel a few terms out. Um, it's a half on both sides, so we can multiply both sides by 2, however you want to think about it. But 
they cancel out. And we have the distance is the same. OK, so we could divide both sides by d squared or, or whatever. But anyway, that they're, they're going to cancel out. OK, the d squared is going to cancel out. So that leaves us with m82, the mass of that uh, 82 iron over the time of the 82 iron squared equals the mass of the 86 iron over the time that ion takes to travel the flight tube squared. Now I'm going to work out what the mass would be of each of those um, to the side. So the mass of the 82 iron um, is going to be, well, uh, one mole would be 82 grams. Um, and we, we would divide that by a thousand because we would need to turn it into kilograms. And we, that would give us the molar mass in kilograms. And we would then divide that by Avogadro's constant. So this is that expression on the left in the blue there. It would be would give us the mass of one Q82 ion. And we could do the same for the 86 ion. So it would be 86 divided by 1,000 and then also divided by Avogadro's constant. So I could substitute these into the, for M, for M82, I could substitute that 82 divided by 1,000 times 6.022 times 10 to 23. And likewise for the M86, I could substitute. But what I'm going to do is, I'm, before I do that, or to simplify things, if I did that, I would be, I would be able to cancel things out. There would be that divided by 1,000 on both sides. And there would be the divided by Avogadro's constant on both sides. So I'm going to do that before I've actually substituted those um, values in. And that now means that 82 over t82 squared equals 86 over t86 squared. And I think I'm right in saying it's, it's about this point that the mark scheme would enter. So the mark scheme would, would sort of assume that you knew that you could leap to that point. You could leap to the point there where I've got in yellow or the arrow there that you would you would recognize in advance that you could just make that that jump. But what I've tried to do initially is to explain why it is you're able to make that or why it is that the mock scheme can come in and say that 82 over t82 squared is equal to 86 over t86 squared. OK, so we're going to go into the next page to carry on with the with the um, with the calculation. OK, so the question was asking us to work out the time it took for the Q86 ion to travel the length of the flight tube. So we are trying to work out this um, T86 squared. That's what we're trying to work out. So I need to make that now the subject of this expression. So I'm going to do that before I put any numbers or do any actual calculating. So I'm going to times both sides by um, T86 squared, and I'm going to times both sides by T82 squared. So that is going to give me the following. It's going to give me 82 times T86 squared equals 86 times T82 squared. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 82. So T86 squared, sorry equals 86 over 82, T82 squared. And then I am actually only want to know what T86 is, so I'm going to square root both sides. And then T82 squared. And we were given what the time of the 82 um, ion took. That time was um, 1.243 times 10 to the minus 5. So now I can put the numbers into my calculation. Um, so I have the square root of 86 over 82 times, and I can take, I can square root the T82 squared 
in advance and take it outside. So now it's 1.243. This was the time we were given times 10 to the minus 5. And the answer to that calculation is uh, 1.273 uh, times 10 to the minus 5 seconds. And that makes sense. Um, it's taken a longer time. So the, T80, the uh, Q86 ion has taken longer than the Q82 ion, which it should do. It's, it's, it's more, has greater mass, so its velocity is going to be less. Um, but it's not dramatically more, uh, because it's not dramatically more massive. So, um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. That would have only been three marks uh, in an exam question. And the reason it would have only been three marks is because they would have pretty much have expected you to have jumped straight to this part here. Um, but I just needed to explain to you how you could arrive at that under, at that point, um, because it might not make sense when you look at a, a mark scheme um, from sort of first principles. So I hope that's been clear. But uh, please say if you've got any queries um, regarding this, because it can be a little bit challenging. Um, and there are a number of different types of time of flight questions.